I try my best to film on Thursdays and then I edit usually Fridays or I'll split it in half between Friday and Saturday. But yesterday was Thursday and social media blew up with Chester, uh, the lead singer of Linkin Park dying. I'm sure everybody heard by now, it was all over social media, it was like plastered on every single site I follow, which is even news stations. I know a bunch of you guys reached out to me and you were like, I'm just upset, and I wasn't even the biggest Linkin Park fan. I felt the same way. Linkin Park, um, I don't know, it was a part of my youth. I think that anytime suicide happens, and then especially if, if some sort of substance abuse is involved, it makes people remember friends or family that they may have lost. So not only was I upset about, you know, the fact that he died, but it was also, it reminds me of my cousin who had suffered from substance abuse and had an accidental overdose and, and suicide. And then you think of Christian who ha was on drugs and he, you know, committed suicide. It's an epidemic that affects all of us. Then someone that's in the limelight that is so big, like Linkin Park, because They've had massive hits on almost every single Transformers movie. It creates this like ripple in the universe and all of us are affected by it and it's just really sad in general when someone dies, whether it's suicide or not. And as fans, we feel it the most. So yesterday was a really sad day. I did not get to film. I'm filming this on Friday today and um, I shouldn't be doing it last minute, but I am trying to pick up the pieces from being upset about yesterday and just kind of becoming non-functional. You guys are not alone. We all felt it. Now the next little random thing I have to tell you guys. So I, one of my friends, I told you I have a few friends that are witches, but I have one friend that gave me this like really good book called, I think it's called Modern Day Witchcraft. I've only made it about halfway through. If you guys want a book to explain a little bit more on witchcraft, I suggest that. It's more of the witchcraft side, not the Wicca side. I've struggled learning Wicca because I don't understand all of the gods and goddesses and it's not something I'm really interested in. So the witchcraft part has been interesting learning, I guess. But here's a fun fact for you guys. I was reading this book the other day and inside the book it explains, you know, the different levels of black magic. I bet you guys didn't know that having road rage and if someone cuts you off and you like yell at them like beep 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 beep, that's considered black magic. And I know I'm not the only one up in here that has had road rage at least once, especially if you've ever driven in LA. Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to talk about last week's Ghost Adventures episode, which was featured at Asylum 49 in Tuella, Utah. I believe I said that right. This will be the only upload this weekend, and that is because I actually have plans with friends this weekend, and so I'm trying to not overwhelm myself and learn how to enjoy life and not work as much. So the one thing I did want to address really quick, if you didn't watch the episode, Asylum 49, they had already been there once. Now the company that actually ran the hospice or the nursing home actually sold it to the people that run the haunted attraction and they purchased it from them. Can we just say for one minute how beautiful the aerial footage that they're using, some sort of a drone for all of their investigations. For some reason, I don't know if it's just Utah and Utah looks similar to Colorado, I just thought it was just beautiful aerial footage that they use. I was really impressed by it. So 2011 was Ghost Adventures' first investigation at Asylum 49. This is when it was still a nursing home, it was still in operation, and they actually ended up interviewing a nurse that worked there, and they bring her back on this episode. Now just backing up for a minute when they were there in 2011, I was really shocked just in general 
that there was a, a haunted house connected to you know a nursing home i thought that was really inappropriate and i couldn't believe that the nursing home couldn't have some sort of say in that other side of the building i just thought it was really strange and i really thought it was inappropriate to be honest like can you imagine going to visit your grandma who's in a nursing home potentially dying while on the other side they're operating like this haunted house place with like ghosts and demons and I just didn't, I didn't like it personally. I thought it was really wrong. But I know Ghost Adventures had nothing to do with that. So the first thing they start to address is this little girl yet again that they're seeing at 3 a.m. and that's when patients are dying and, and they basically think this little girl is running around possibly being the torment or purpose for why these patients are dying at 3 a.m. So wait a second, what is 3 a.m.? It can be called dead time, dark time, devil's hour. Basically it's from 3 to 4 o'clock is supposed to be the most active time of night for ghost hunting or for experiencing entities from the other side. 3.33 to be specific is the highlight of the night. So 3.33. 3, 3. Once again, why is 3 significant? It's the mocking of the Holy Trinity, Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, which is why they think when demons attack or demons actually show up to kind of perform or show themselves, it's always in threes, which once again, they're saying in this nursing home, when patients would die, it would be not only at three in the morning, but they would happen to die in numbers of threes. So one patient, two patient, three patients would die. Three o'clock in the morning is basically when the most evil comes out. This is when the dark entities have the most energy to actually show themselves or to um, manifest on the, on this earth. This is also interesting if you tie it into 3 a.m. nightmares. Have you guys ever had nightmares and when you wake up it's at 3 o'clock or 3.30 or 3.33? That can be a sign that something dark is around. I've actually had nightmares and woke up the next night at 3 a.m. after I've had investigations, especially if it is around dark stuff. So the biggest thing I can tell you guys if you're having nightmares or if it's after an investigation, try to keep some sort of a dream journal so you can write down things that you remember because you're not always gonna remember you know, an hour or two later. So if you have a dream journal right there, you can start recording when you're having these nightmares and what they're about. So apparently the most dark place or the most haunted location of this area that they're investigating is called the Green Mile, which oddly is this section that's not only connected to the actual nursing home itself, but it's the hallway that connects the nursing home into this Asylum 2049 haunted attraction thing for Halloween. It's described as some sort of an oppressive space. So when you're hearing about someone say there's like some sort of a hallway or an oppressive space, the first thing you're gonna consider is, is this some sort of a doorway to the other side? Is this a portal? Or in general, if you're having a haunted location like this where you're having not only fake blood and fake you know dummies that are dressed up like scary clowns or dead bodies on the floor, and then you're also hiring people as characters to come in and uh, portray like scary characters like on an actor's side of course when you have those things going on it's going to draw in that dark energy because you're surrounding yourself by a make-believe dark force or dark area I've known people that have worked for haunted locations that are actually afraid um, not just during the season, but year round because they feel like it summons in the darkness. It's almost welcoming the dark side in and so it's a place for it to harbor. So is the Green Mile space some sort of a connected doorway or a portal that's kind of been created because of Asylum 49 and this haunted location. Was I shocked that the nurse was fired? So they had this nurse in 2011 that was an eyewitness that was sharing, she's seeing these dark energies and it's you know scary for the patients and um, they're afraid to watch the tapes in the nursing station because they're seeing shadows and apparitions walk around during the night at 3 a.m. No, I'm not shocked that she went on TV um, told the truth, yes, but she got fired. Of course she was gonna get fired because anyone that sees that episode of Ghost Adventures and doesn't realize that it could be a haunted location and their family member is in the nursing home, they could potentially come in as a family and remove that person from the nursing home afraid that a dark energy is gonna harbor, you know, especially if they're a religious person, 
They're going to be in fear for their family member's life. And then the company itself as a nursing home is going to lose the thousands and thousands of dollars that they either get from um, the state care that the elderly person is on or if the family is paying for out of pocket. It is thousands and thousands of dollars to put someone in a nursing home. So no, it doesn't shock me that she was fired because the company of the nursing home itself was probably afraid they were going to lose a bunch of patients or not get any new patients which oddly could be why it ended up shutting down. They never really said why the nursing home was shut down as a business together. So of course they're like, oh, she opened her mouth. We could potentially lose a lot of business because of this because there's a lot of money involved in the healthcare industry. And so they fired her. They were like, well, you shouldn't have opened your mouth. You should have stayed out of it. You didn't have our permission. And technically that does, that is kind of true. Like even in the paranormal contract world, so the nurse, when they interviewed her in 2011, technically she was on, you know, staff on the hour when they were investigating and when they came in to actually interview her. So she could have technically been on the clock when she was being interviewed and showing them around the nursing home. So she probably had kind of a reason to get fired, unfortunately. She also needed the permission of the nursing home in order to not only go on camera, but also go on camera and talk about you know these dark things. So she probably would have needed some sort of a release to be signed since she was actually being interviewed by Zach for a television series representing that nursing home. So no, it doesn't really shock me. It could have been a contract ordeal. Um, you know, she basically could have caused the downfall of this nursing home to go under as a business. Do I think she was telling the truth? Absolutely, I am not discrediting her as an eyewitness. I definitely believe what she saw and what she experienced was completely true. I just think that, you know, as owners of the nursing home, they probably had a right to let her go as an employee. So the nurse obviously states in 2011 that there's some sort of a dark figure, a shadow man, there's also a little girl, and she's also complaining as the man in black or demonic figure is what she's seeing walk into these rooms or the little girl walk into the patient's rooms and then if they go and check in them later the patient has actually been deceased or died. She also said this happens in threes. If one patient would die they would know that two more were to come. Once again, do I think Marie the nurse told the truth? Absolutely, I think she told the truth. You can hear in her voice that she starts to shake. She was upset. She started to cry because she truthfully felt like her patients were in danger. You know, as a nurse, I found it very interesting that she didn't say that they died. She said, I was here when they crossed over. So that tells you she has a serious, um, you know, relationship built on professionally as a nurse and caring for her patients. So it probably did upset her seeing these things because a lot of people find entities or ghosts overwhelming when they're trying to protect people from them or families even at home because it's an invisible force so they don't really know how to protect them with a, a robber or a burglar um, you can you know you can own weapons to protect your home you can have uh, ADT or whatever a house you know company come in and um, put like monitors on your house so that you're sure that your house is protected. A lot of people feel overwhelmed when they're being surrounded by dark forces or entities because they don't feel like they can physically protect themselves or in her case protect their patients because it's something that's invisible. The one thing that freaked me out though what Marie said was she goes when we can hear the kids playing in the hallways or the little girl laughing. She literally said, we know death is coming. That's terrifying to me. So once again, we can keep adding, you know, this data collection of hearing little girls or hearing kids laugh. It always seems to be a little girl entity and that always seems to connect with something dark. So I don't know how much more clear I need to be with you guys. If you're going into an investigation and there's a little girl or a little girl's laughing, now don't automatically assume it's a demon or darkness. Do keep in mind that when a demon comes out or something seriously dark or demonic, they always present themselves as something trustworthy, like a little girl laughing or playing. So now Zach also interviews this male coworker. I can't tell if he's like a medic or a nurse or a medical assistant, but he also says that he responds to deaths that happen at 3 a.m. So 3 a.m., let's go back to this. It's the occult belief that this is the opposite of when Christ died, 12 hours after Christ died. So it's kind of like the Antichrist hour is why they represent using 3 a.m. to um, show themselves or communicate, or in this case, possibly kill patients. The female nurse that he interviewed, Marie, 
I felt really bad for her because she was upset about the patients dying. She was physically shaking. You could hear it in her voice. Like she was not joking about this. And I think she may have some fear that patients have been left behind there as far as their souls. So I think that was where her like true empathy was coming from. It wasn't because she was in fear of the apparitions. I think she was more afraid of um, energies getting stuck there, patients that she'd cared for. Now another thing, she pointed out this dark room at the end of the hallway and then this male nurse also pointed it out that they didn't like to take patients there because she would always be afraid for the patients to be alone in there. They never said if they had an accumulated rate of deaths in that room. That was just the, the vibe I got was if they took patients in that room they would die so they tried not to. But the male staffer also said that the Green Mile was you know, the place they saw the most apparitions, especially on the monitor. I was disappointed that when Ghost Adventures did the investigation, they didn't catch anything on the monitor, but I was impressed that they were able to get that camera up and working again and continue to get live footage. So give them mad props. They're still trying to recreate something that was already there that people had used as you know, as a witness protest, basically. Like, I'm looking through this camera, and here's the monitor, and this is where I'm seeing the apparitions. For them to be able to continue to use that monitor system and try to get evidence off of it, good job. That is a really good part of investigating, is trying to stay as authentic to the eyewitnesses that you have heard and trying to recreate that, and they literally recreated that. Even though they didn't get, you know, any evidence, they still recreated it. That was awesome. I was really freaked out when they said that this like janitor put a piece of tape over the lens. I'm going to be honest and say that I didn't agree with that. Even if they were seeing apparitions and it was scaring them at the nurse station, what if a patient would have got up and tripped and fell and they weren't able to see? I, mean, I think that this camera was pointing into the green mile, right? What if someone fell and they didn't know it? Like I just didn't agree with that, so I was like... You know, I know that it's scary and I know these nurses don't like working at 3 a.m., but that is something that's terrifying. So I would be more upset that a patient got injured than I would be worried about seeing apparitions walk around at 3 a.m. I got that same vibe from Zach, from the guy that actually purchased the property, is he's like, why would they put tape over the monitor? Okay, I see, you know, it's about the spirits, but God, what if a freaking patient would have fell and got hurt? I wonder if that ever happened. It's not out of the realm of possibilities, you know what I mean? Okay, so now we have Billy say that he's gonna go in and stay the night. Oh man, Billy, I don't know. I'm giving him mad props for having the EKG machine. That is so cool. He got like basically a... A monitor that is kind of portable so that was really cool man I don't know what is up with Zach wanting Billy to sleep on these like beds that have like bodily fluids on them thank God Billy was like nope I'm not do I'm not sleeping in that bed thank God because that could be a serious sanitary issue if any of them sleep on these bodily fluid filled mattresses you couldn't pay me enough to do that. Now, I have to say how cute did Billy look with his little hospital gown on and he got really scared and like, I had to laugh when he got scared in the hospital bed. Like, how many of you guys have been at home and you're like dead asleep and it's dead quiet and then like your roommate slams the door or like your parents come home and like they're really loud or like your sister or brother like slams something down and you're like, ah! Like, I felt like that is like, we've all experienced like, what Billy did like we've all felt his pain of like being jumbled when you wake up and so now we know with you know the proof of an EKG machine that you're basically preparing yourself to have a heart attack so thank you roommate thank you parents thank you siblings for about trying to kill me when you slammed that door that time so Billy gets up he hears this huge slam really great evidence that they captured this door slamming um, he ended up not being able to handle it and he had to leave, but who noticed Billy's little ankle tattoo? Is that just like the cutest little ankle tattoo? Did anybody else notice that or was it just me? I just thought it was a cute little tattoo. It's like a little charm bracelet on his ankle. Okay, now we have Aaron Goodwin coming in. He has to go fix this camera. All I can tell you is when he's walking into the hallway because he's hearing like footsteps, he turns around to the camera. Does he not appear to look like the perfect mall cop or like reenactment of Paul Blart getting ready to like bust in on somebody in the bathroom where he heard the water? It made me laugh so hard because it just, he had that like, you know, that stance of like what a mall cop would be doing. Like he was like 
all concerned, like he heard something going on. And then Aaron, I have to admit, like I know I've been that scared where I've literally like had to push myself up against the wall. I've had a couple instances at the Stanley Hotel where I've had something um, where it felt like, I don't wanna say malevolent, I don't wanna say um, dark, I just wanna say very powerful. When you feel that energy, that is when you like have to go against the wall because you want to feel the wall to your back and you don't want to feel anything in between, you know what I mean? But Aaron has some beautiful ballet skills because he did that like really pretty turn and like curtsy and he like threw his iPhone on the floor and then next all we hear is Zach on the radio, iPhone down, <laughs> oh my God. And poor Aaron, we, we know this, that he has no survival instinct. If something happens, he has no survival instinct. He just went against the wall and dropped his phone, which has his only flashlight, which now means he's in the pitch black. So poor Aaron. So now we go into where Zach is actually in this like little, I don't know if it's kind of like a theater room set up. It looks like maybe it was where um, they would have staff meetings or something. And I was really impressed with how respectful Zach was being to the entities. Like that's the first time I think he's really had just the utmost respect for the energies because you do have to realize going into a location, the probability of running into human spirits that were patients versus actually demons or darkness, the probability is higher that you're gonna run into human spirits because it was a nursing home and people did die there a lot. So he put out first, you know, that he wanted to make sure that the en energies were there and that they were patients. And then he said, is there something really bad and nasty and dark here? So I was just so impressed with the respectfulness he had for the, the human spirits that were probably still trapped there. So then the next thing though, is Zach hears this like little girl laughing or talking or giggling. And he says that he's frozen. He says he's terrified. It sounds like his voice is shaking a little bit. And for the first time, he doesn't provoke. So I found that very interesting. We know how Zach is. He's always like, come up out of that hole and get us and blah, blah, blah. And we know he's not afraid to, you know, talk trash to an energy. So I was really shocked. He must have been really afraid for him not to just be coming all out, you know, arms out, guns out, and just stood there in silence instead. So poor Aaron gets sent to the Green Mile by himself. Did you guys notice when they showed his footage, his camera light was on? So like you guys have to realize like to me looking as a viewer that place that location didn't look, you know, as scary as some of the other locations they've been, but Aaron was so afraid he had his camera light on. So just remember like just because as a viewer when you're not there when you're in there, the energy, you feel that energy so much more, especially if you guys are investigators that are watching. I have been there where you feel like you've had like four flashlights on and that's not enough. Because it feels like almost the darkness is like swallowing you. So you could just tell that's how afraid Aaron was of going to the Green Mile alone. So now once Aaron gets down there, Aaron goes, I swear I just heard Zach's voice. I know it's not him, but it sounded like Zach's voice. So remember, we're going back to demonic mimicking. This is something that demons love to do. Why? Why is there a demon portraying itself as a little girl and when the little girl walks in the room, the patient dies? Because demons like to make you trust them. How do you make them trust me? I am I'm a bad thing. I'm a fallen angel, whatever. I'm, I'm of the darkness. I'm... Um, you know, of the satanic ritual. How do I make people trust me if I'm this dark? Mm, let's be a kid and let's pretend to be Zach, his friend. So that then he turns around and he's like, hey, Zach, are you here? And so he's already trusting of him. But luckily, Aaron's been through this enough that his little light bulb goes off and he's like, that's not Zach. That is something trying to pretend to be Zach. As the episode starts to wind down, Zach decides to go meet Aaron as Aaron's doing this like spirit box session and Aaron's standing at the end of the hall. Zach walks out to him in front of the actual night vision camera and it illuminates him to look like a perfect full bodied apparition. And we see Aaron at the end of the hall look like he is, he looks like he's a hamster stuck at the wrong end of the maze and he's like, uh, uh, and he's like running in a circle. Oh my God, I thought I was gonna die. Like that sounds so mean, but that made me laugh so hard. I've had that happen to me actually, guys. Like you'll have like an investigator walk towards you, especially if you're in a big location and something about the night vision, the illumina the illumination of the night vision makes them just disappear and they look like a full perfect apparition and 
poor Aaron. He's on the floor laughing and he goes, I'm going to crap myself. Then again, they're walking through. Zach screams because he hears that man talk in his ear. Billy gets so scared. <laughs> like this was more comical. I hate to say that. Like I take them very serious, but I think that if you've been an investigator and you've been in those situations where I have, like it makes you think back and like, oh man, I have been there. And like when you're looking at it from an audience perspective, it's freaking hilarious. I mean, as investigators, how many times has that happened to us, you know? So the next thing I found really interesting, 3 a.m., Billy pulls out this new piece of equipment that he says that him and Bill Chappell have designed. Does anybody uh, guess what it may be? So he calls it a, I have it written down, a spirit sweep device that collects environmental data, electromagnetic and static um, electricity, um, and basically collects the data. It's basically in ovulus mode, so it's not in like a spirit box sort of mode. He says that the de device sweeps, it changes frequency, you know, according to the air and the energy in the air. And then all of a sudden he starts messing with, you know, this like digital outline he has on this little computer screen. And it sure sounds like guitar amp and pedals, doesn't it? Who else um, heard what I heard? What does this mean? This means Bill Chapel and Billy have now recreated the huff box. I never said the huff box didn't work. I just said that the huff box was overpriced. So it looks like Steve Huff may not have gotten a patent design on this, which he should have, or even if he didn't, Bill Chapel has taken the theme of it and he has ran with it. Now this is a brand new spanking digital version of the huff box. It comes with a touch screen and boy, does it look fancy schmancy. Of course, you guys know I will be the first one to purchase it when they release it on their website. I will keep you in tune for anything I hear. So Billy says that it adds filters, which you can obviously tell is like the equalizer guitar amps that we've we've heard before with the um, Huff Box before, the Wonder Box. And then he says it tunes out frequencies. Sorry, I have notes because I wanna make sure I'm accurate. He says that it sweeps based on environmental data. So I'm assuming that humidity is also included in that. Um, along with some sort of like, uh, well, he said electromagnetic field. So if the probes or the antennas that they have there are communicating with the entity or the energy in the air, that is how the entity is able to manipulate what it's going to say or what it's trying to say. I was really impressed with Zach. He said to the energy, if anyone's here, this is what you need to do to try to manifest and then you can talk to me. That is what you need to do if you go into a location with pretty much any piece of equipment, even if it's a mel meter, even if it's a spirit box, unless you're going somewhere that has been overran, like the Stanley Hotel, like the Lizzie Borden house, all that stuff. Those energies already know how to interact because people go there all the time with spirit boxes and night vision. So you don't have to explain it to those energies. If you're in a location that has minimal to no contact with you know, actual ghost hunters and ghost investigators that have all this equipment, you need to reach out to the energies verbally and tell them how they can use this to communicate with you. And they will have an easier time and they won't be as afraid to come up to you and communicate with your devices. So the fact that Zach showed that on TV, I was super impressed yet again because people forget to do that. People will go into these locations that are like, middle of nowhere tiny towns with like a haunted inn, take all this fancy equipment and then not explain to the energies how to use it or they're too afraid to walk up to them. So because this guitar amp and pedal thing is working and they got three clear like, I don't know if you'd call those DVPs or EVPs. One said help me, one said thank you for that. And the last one said I'm back home. So those are interesting. I wonder if he meant I'm back home at the actual nursing home or did he mean he transferred to the other side? I don't know, I found it really compelling that that is what this energy said. Who knows what the price of this is going to be from Bill Chapel? We still don't know the official name or title of this, but you guys know I will be the first to have it and I will show you as soon as I get it. In fact, I wanted to tell you I'm going to do another video um, not of actually investigating with the SLS cam. I'm going to actually kind of break it down to you guys and tell you how it works and why it works that way, plus the data collection that it does collect from the sensors that are actually on the SLS cam. It won't be a super long video because it's not the most complex piece of equipment. I actually kind of built my own half-ass SLS cam back in the day, and that was when you would you could take your MacBook and you could hack your MacBook um, to basically get a connector that would connect your um, 
oh, let's see, not your Xbox One, but your Xbox 360 X cam. And so I actually hacked my MacBook to connect with my X cam from my old school Xbox 360 back in the day. I don't know if I really should have just admitted that I know how to hack MacBooks on YouTube, but it was all in the name of research for ghost hunting, right? So that makes it okay. So Zach goes around with the SLS cam, they debunk some footage that is still, once again, makes them look legitimate. Billy finds an EVP of the old man. This is this old man that's basically seems to be following Zach around because he heard him in that like kind of meeting room before. Um, they think that they captured this old man's voice through this new device that Bill Chapel builds. So it seems to me like this energy is probably definitely a human spirit, but he has somehow attached to Zach and felt comfortable the most communicating with and through Zach's energy. The evidence was awesome that they captured. Once again, it wasn't a ton of evidence, but that's okay. They debunked stuff. That's what we want to see. We want to see legitimate stuff. We are tired of the riffraff and the fake stuff. I would rather see them debunk a bunch of stuff and hear about the history and see the creepy location and feel like you're there because we know as investigators, I've been to locations where you just don't gather that much evidence. It's just the way it is. I know you'll be sad. I don't have another video planned for this weekend. I am so sorry, but of course I'll be back next weekend. For those of you asking about the YouTube live video, yes, I did do a YouTube live video last week. Um, anyone that got to experience it, please comment below about what happened. It was against concert rules if I left it up, so I did take it down because I did enter into the travel channel um, application process. I am not allowed to discuss it technically when I submitted the video. I am now in contract, so I cannot tell you guys anything from here on out. What did you guys think about Asylum 49? Do you agree with me that you didn't think it originally should have been a nursing home connected to a haunted attraction? Make sure you guys give my video a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Make sure you guys follow me on social media, and I will catch you guys next time. Back from the dead, dead, dead.